Can I hear anything? Talking, but um, there we go. Okay, microphone off. So that's good. I'm glad you showed up. That saved me an hour of time that I would have otherwise wasted. So uh, welcome. I'm going to start doing our lecture all over again. Are you ready? I am. Can you see the screen? Okay. Yes. All right. So hello. This is Professor. Harry, known on the internet as Harry Hawk, and uh, this is week five. Our course is almost over uh, after this week, uh, week six. We'll do a little bit more reading, and then all the reading is finished to give us some time to focus on a group assignment and give you more time to work on your final project. Um, our agenda is all about customer service and service culture, all of the finer points of customer service, and then very important being able to adapt the service culture, uh, all of the modern aspects of customer service. That is a really hard thing to do. We have a partial reading list here. Um, for the full list, you really need to go to Canvas, but I'm focusing on some key pages today from chapter 10. And if you can pay close attention to these pages, it will help this work. Bettina, I'm going to mute you for now. Okay. Uh, and then I'll come back to you. And if you have questions, you can always raise your hand. Okay. All right. So here we continue to our outcomes. So these are really important outcomes, uh, some of the most important learning outcomes for the course. Essentially, students should be able to translate the concepts of service profit chain and service scapes into what's needed for events and festivals. And students should understand what's meant by service recovery and be able to formulate examples. Service recovery, in short, is when there is a problem, a complaint, an issue, a concern by a consumer, and how we deal with it, how we recover the service, meaning how do we get them back as a customer. Um, you should understand why great customer service is important. I think we all kind of acknowledge that good customer service is great to have, but it really is critical, and again, especially for events because you often only have one or two times a year to ever impact the customers uh, unlike another type of business where they might have daily weekly or monthly interactions you should understand the basic concept within the service profit chain and the term that they use service delivery system in short that is your staff and all the tools and the technology that the staff use to deliver great service and finally you should understand that staff as I just noted, is a major part of their service delivery system. But specifically here, if you're not keeping your staff happy, the staff will not be able to keep their guests happy, your guests happy. And um, again, really hard with an event where that event may only last for a few hours once a year, or maybe several days once a year. So um, we'll have to put our thinking caps on and figure out how this will work. So all of the notes and things, the charts, images, for the most part that you'll see have come from the textbook. Customer service is the practice of delivering products and services to both internal and external customers via the efforts of employees or through the provisions of an appropriate service scape. The service scape is the physical and ambient conditions in which you deliver the service. And we talked about this last week, we're talking about it again. The service scape is the environment that you're delivering your event. It may be inside a convention hall, inside a VFW post. It may be at a local park or museum. So it's all of the existing infrastructure, but everything you brought in for the event, the AV equipments, uh, the food preparation, um, special uh, extra bathrooms, sometimes outdoor events, have a large number of portable toilets of various kinds, all of these contribute to the physical space uh, and the ambient conditions, sound, light, sense of smell, 
as well as what we call signs and artifacts. Signs and artifacts include, well, signs like enter here, exit only, staff only, uh, line up here, this way to room 22, and all of the digital signs and things that we have in ServiceScape, as well as all the materials. So if we have a, a bunch of booths at our convention, uh, and all of the booths have uh, pipe and drape, in other words, uh, all the curtains that separate one booth from another, if they're all in mustard green, well, that mustard green is an artifact. It's a part of the material choice of uh, how you pick which curtains, what carpeting and so forth, even the color of the lights, if you have so picked colored lights. Um, so then when we're delivering service, and we're focused on it, we want to get the best service ultimately from our staff. It's ultimately the staff who are answering the phones, answering the tweets, sending text messages, talking to people in person, helping people. It's our staff that are delivering the service. And the service profit chain, which is in the book, and there is a reading on it, um, connects or creates a chain, this logic that says that when we support our employees, when we ensure employee satisfaction, we will gain ultimately loyal customer satisfaction and ultimately loyalty of everyone and ultimately profits. And uh, we'll, we'll look at the service profit chain later, but it is also in the textbook, figure 10.1. And this service profit chain uh, suggests that there are these critical linkages among internal service, employee satisfaction, and the value of the services provided to the customer and ultimately, again, that customer satisfaction, which means retention and profit. Simply, if we can keep our employees happy and satisfied, so satisfied, happy is, you know, they're literally happy, they're smiling, they're happy, they enjoy working for you, those sorts of things. They enjoy the challenges that they face, but, beyond simple satisfaction of the customer. Again, is you see productivity. Beyond that simple satisfaction and productivity, if we are not able to ensure that the staff are satisfied in terms of the work that they're doing, they're not gonna be satisfied in a way that's gonna allow them to help and support and encourage the best possible customer treatment. And then our customers will be unhappy. Ultimately, they won't stay with us, they won't be loyal, and we won't be able to grow our profit. So that is the service profit chain. Essentially take care of the staff, the staff will take care of the customers, and that will drive profits, retention, and so forth. This is, again, especially hard to do in a event environment because our event is so short-lived. Often our staff are temporary people uh, or people that we only hire and work with once or twice a year. So it just speaks to one of the important things that you have to do with an event is pay really extra special care to selecting the key employees that you are working with on a regular basis, the employees who will be coming back, the managers and so forth, whoever you have or wherever you can influence to bring in quality. In New York, there's some major DJ events, as you can imagine, some of these events might have 100,000 people. Um, the gentlemen or ladies who are running these really large DJ events who do they hire to handle some of the activities? You'd think they might hire some kids or something, but they actually hire their competitors. They hire some of the best managers in the DJ business, in the club business, because they know they need the top quality people there if they're gonna have 100,000 people happy. So the service profit chain really implies having a service culture that is as a business that we're dedicated to the activity of customer service. And in tourism and hospitality, right, we need to establish that. We're not there to rip people off. Um, again, especially hard for events because they're so short lived. And so how can we establish this culture when we don't really have a culture, when we're here today 
and literally we're gone tomorrow. Um, and we know that it's critical, not just for keeping the customers happy, but for making the marketing of our event effective. Um, we'll talk about this quite a bit, but ultimately if people are unhappy, they're gonna share that on social media and the word will get out that we have a bad event. And conversely, if we are treating people really well, well, that will get out and that will help market the event as well. So, uh, Bettina, I'm unmuting you here. A any questions at this point? No, but you made a good point about the hiring the competitors because that's exactly what I was doing. Awesome, wanna talk about that for a minute? Sure. Um, so with my event, um, I was actually looking at my competitors and because they are also associated with the type of cultural food that I am providing, um, I felt like there was a need just to have them there to kind of expose them and just because they're part of the same culture, I just figured just having that same um, that same type of food and um, the vibes of that of those businesses there would make a difference and just kind of show that, you know, we're, we're here as a community to kind of not be against each other, but, you know, just to come together and, and provide the same services and good hospitality as we would for our own businesses. Well, that makes a, absolutely a lot of sense. Um, so, you know, and also obviously you don't want them necessarily um, that same day competing with you, you know, you want to be, Fair and have an open event. If it's really open to the community, it has to be open to every part of the community. So that's, I think that's a great, great idea for you. Thank you. All right, I'm going to mute you again. So let's okay. have another question right now. No, that's all. All right. So back to the lecture. You may hear my dog in the background snoring whenever I start talking. She goes to sleep. Hopefully, you guys are staying awake. So, service training. How do we train our, we, well, let me read it as it says here. We need to train ourselves to treat our staff well. Sometimes in the heat of things, it's easy to yell and scream at our staff. It might even be popular or seem like if you watch things like David Ramsey uh, on TV, Hell's Kitchen, that sort of thing. Uh, it may seem that that's what you're supposed to do, but hopefully we all know that we're not. We're not supposed to mistreat our staff or yell or scream but we need to make sure that we are going above and beyond really uh, being empathetic and concerned connected to our staff then after we've worked on ourselves then we need to train our staff to treat the customers well and again in a normal business we can bring in outside training we can take us half a day where we all go to a park or some activity and work on customer service. We can create videos. There's all kinds of things we can do because if you have a, a business that runs 365 days a year or you know many days of the year and runs year after year, um, you can make that investment. Um, but how will that work for our event business? Because a good the security people have their own needs where they need to feel safe um, but they can sometimes crack down in a way verbally or visually um, or physically in a way that we don't want like they need to understand that the, our guests are not their enemy um, and sometimes you can see that happen but overall how can we train temps to deliver great customer service it's hard and a lot of it has to be by example and a lot of it has to do with the managers that we pick. Um, and so why is all of this important? The textbook talks about turning customers into apostles. Um, the idea of this quadrant, we don't want uh, them to feel like they're a hostage or that they're somehow against us, that you know they've become so angry with us that they're a defector, they're actively maybe even lying about our business. Um, 
trying to actively sabotage us or pull customers away. Um, and we don't want them to feel like they're a mercenary, but, you know, they're, that they're kind of locked in and fighting for us, but it's not really their choice, right? A mercenary is someone who's paid to fight versus that loyalist who, who's there to fight because they believe, right? If you're, you know, fighting for your country, generally you're a loyalist, but if you're paid to fight for another country, right, that's a mercenary. We know this from the American Revolution, the Hessians were German soldiers that the Brits brought in to fight the Americans because they didn't want to use their own uh, troops as much. Well, they don't really buy in because they're mercenary. They're just there for the paycheck. We don't want our customers to feel uh, that way, or again, a, a hostage. We want them to be in this quadrant of high satisfaction and high loyalty. And in part, because then they're gonna share, talk about, and you know, word of mouth and all of those things, but also ultimately uh, through social media. And let me just check in uh, with Bettina again. How are we doing here? Good, still listening. Uh, any any thoughts on, on this? Have you been uh, a customer somewhere where you're where you've been a real loyalist? Um, I have. Target is my favorite. <laughs> uh, they've they've messed up a couple times, but um, I always go back just because they're really good at returning um, merchandise and and they always find a way to bring me back. So okay, they found a way to bring you back. Which, by the way, is talking about this chart right here. So what do they do to bring you back? Um, they sent me coupons and they also um, gave me a, uh, what are they called? The gift cards, like store credit. Um, when I didn't have my receipt, I didn't have my debit card. And basically I needed one or the other for them to find, you know, to basically figure out if I really purchased the item there. Um, so either way, they still... They didn't give me a refund through cash or debit, but they gave me a refund via uh, store credit. Which is fantastic. Service recovery, when you have a problem, and so sometimes it's like it's broken, or I didn't get good service, or I asked for a grapefruit and I got an orange, so I need to fix that. But sometimes like, you know, what you just bring up, it may not be defective, it's just you want to return an item, and you don't have the right paperwork, right? Right. Some stores have really high demand, like you have to have this and that, and you've got so many days, and they can make it very complicated. So uh, in, in, in that case, the problem is really the business that they're demanding a lot, and, and sometimes, you know, a legitimate customer wants to just return something. Agreed? Yes. All right, so then the question is, how do we fix that? So we'll get into some of the details, but essentially we're gonna acknowledge the customer, we're gonna be empathetic, and ultimately we're gonna make amends. So when you say that they gave you some coupons or, or gift cards, right, that's how they're making amends. Mm -hmm. And the paradox, something that just doesn't seem natural or doesn't seem like it would add up, is that you think if you had no problem you'd be a loyal customer, which is true. It's this dashed line. But it turns out when there is a failure and you do proper service recovery, in fact, you end up with a more loyal customer, which is, Bettina, that's exactly how you described yourself. Yes, that is true. So <coughs> and with a business like Target, which you know goes out of its way to make sure that they have new products, interesting products, that they reflect the different communities that they work in, that they have products that are just visually interesting, you know, kind of design, you know, nice looking products, all a bunch of different things that they try to do. Um, they're not always gonna do it right, um, but it's easy, whatever they're doing, again, they have staff who work every day, you know, almost, you know, obviously five, six days a week, you know, 52 weeks a year, we have our lonely events. And again, we maybe our event is a one day, two day event. But Tina, how long is, is yours going to be a, a one day event? Just so one day, yes. And how many hours? Um, 
well normally for like the actual event or for like when employees and set up and for the time that the people are there um most likely it'll start around 11 o'clock and end at between seven and eight okay so maybe you know nine ten hours right yes now our staff may be there a day or two ahead of time to set up at the end of the night they may be there a long time to clean up maybe even a little bit the next day but that's two or three days a year that you're going to have your staff and so as you can see that the conundrum is how do we train them to give good service any any thoughts patina um well i would just say um as far as training goes i would try to hire qualified employees that might already work within the industry um, of, of events. Um, I know they have staffing agencies, um, which I can probably try to arrange something within that field um, and bring those type of employees in and just make sure that um, they are qualified in those areas and um, look at their resume, interview them, of course, and uh, go that route. Um, I would, I'm sorry? In cases, it may not be possible to really review every resume. I mean, I'm thinking of like really large events where you might be picking up a couple hundred people who are going to be taking badges and that kind of thing. Uh, for your event, you're still going to have a lot of people, but yes. Everything you're describing is kind of what you need to do. But I would go further and say what's really important is there's a few key individuals, obviously yourself. And again, as I said on this slide, training yourself to deliver, but also the managers that you hire. People that maybe have worked on the event for several months with you so that they have a lot at stake you know, and they kind of have some skin in the game. Um, okay. Does that make sense? Yes. And then for the people who are just there for the day, right? If the event starts at 11, you may have a half dozen to a couple dozen people who show up at 10 o'clock. Uh, and yes, they may have worked at other events in the past, but those other events may have other rules and they may, in the, in the, in the face of no direct instruction from you, they may find themselves falling back on older practices, which may be perfectly good for some other event, maybe a more corporate event, but it may not be good for your event, which is very people community based, right? Right. And so one of the things that I can think of is how you make it fun, because you know we could take everybody and literally throw them up against the wall and threaten them. Customer service is important and you better do a good job, right? That's not going to work, right? Right. So how do we make it fun and exciting? And maybe, you know, it's some buttons or badges that we put on people, uh, you know, reminding uh, service with a smile or family, friends, community, these kinds of things. But also, like, we can see this roadmap here for service recovery. Maybe this goes on a card. Maybe we give everybody... Um, a little kind of wallet card that has some of these steps on it. And like for that day, maybe you have a special uh, phone number or you're on a walkie talkie, maybe you're on a particular. You're gone. No sound, Harry. Harry? But Hello? you're not. Okay. And the person who's there is trying to, you know, work through it, and, and they may make it worse, um, thinking that, you know, you know, they were told, don't, don't, we don't want to hear from you. You better not call us, right? You don't want to send the signal that you don't want to be called. You want, obviously, at some point, you can't be called for every transaction, but does it make sense to let them know that you really do want them to reach out to you or a manager? Yes, it does. Uh, just to have that point of contact for someone they could at least call, um, not not to come to uh, wherever the problem is, but just to kind of have a point of reference to have an answer for those customers who have a problem. Absolutely. 
very well said. And so here's some major steps of service recovery. We apologize and urgent reinstatement. In other words, if you ordered a hamburger, which is a cheeseburger without cheese, right? You ordered a, you know, a hamburger, not a cheeseburger. You got a cheeseburger. You know, we got to acknowledge that right away. We got to do something to remove the source of disappointment. We have to tell the customer legitimately and urgently, like, well, we'll try to help you out sometime tomorrow. No, you know, we're gonna, I'm here. I'm going to help you right now. We're going to resolve this as best we can. Uh, I don't know. You know, we're going to have to do a little research. You, you got to be honest. You can't say it's all going to be amazing. We're going to give you a brand new car because you've got an orange instead of an apple. But, you know, we, we have to, with urgency, remove the source of customer disappointment. And then we need to be empathetic, uh, legit, not fake empathy, but I'm so sorry that this has happened. That sounds horrible, um, right? We have to acknowledge whatever it is, even if for you, you'd be like inside your voice, inside your head is that's not really a problem. Let me tell you about my problems. I got real problems. Whatever your inner thoughts are, right? That doesn't matter to the customer. It's their own thoughts that matter to them. And we have to be empathetic to their cause. That makes sense, Bettina? Yes, it does. It makes a lot of sense. And then this symbolic atonement. The next step is to make amends in some tangible way, which is what you have described, getting some coupons, a gift card. Uh, it may be, um, you, you know, at, at McDonald's, literally I have ordered uh, a san breakfast sandwich with no cheese and I've gotten extra cheese. And my ticket says no cheese. It's not like they didn't hear me. All right want to return it and this is mcdonald's but they gave me an actual the manager came to the window gave me an apology uh offered me a free coffee but i didn't need it because i was on my way to my favorite coffee bar but she gave me a bottle of water and uh, apple pie that's the correct sandwich yes that's definitely going to bring the customer back yeah i was shocked you know like the mcdonald's is you know normally they're like oh we're sorry they don't sound like they're sorry. This was like, <laughs> right? sorry, not sorry. <laughs> sorry, not sorry. <laughs> um, that's funny. Right? That's, but, you know, the manager, <laughs> the window, she, you know, I'm the manager. This is my fault. You know, she wasn't like, oh, we got a new kid and he screwed up. I'm going to fire him. But, you know, this was my fault. I'm the manager. This is my fault. And right. that's important too, just in an event where there are managers and you have maybe someone working in the front, someone working in food service, you have another manager doing all the conference rooms and then a manager on the floor of the main event. Again, every event is different. You can have uh, different amounts of managers in different rooms and things, but sometimes someone coming over and saying, I'm the manager and I'm sorry, goes a long way versus somebody who's at the front line. Even if that front line person may be the owner of the company, Sometimes because someone's on the front line, they're not perceived or, or sometimes, you know, because the person who's working with the customer may, may be young and that, that person may be their event, right? But right. They're, they're young, their perception may be that they, ju they just somebody who works there who doesn't care. Makes sense. All right. And finally, follow up, um, which is, you know, reaching out, maybe something as little as a survey or calling up a follow up um a letter uh we hope to see you back here um a gift bag or something might be special at an event sometimes there's vip gift bags if something happened to somebody they're not a vip let, let me upgrade you to vip or let me give you we'll give you the vip gift bag or here's a here's a coupon for uh food for tickets when i ran water taxi beach we have ten thousand people um a weekend uh, most of the transactions were cash or credit card ultimately, but some the first couple of years was mostly uh, cash. But we, we printed up our own money, so to speak, so that we didn't want to have to just have somebody walk up somewhere and say, oh, I, I'm owed a free drink or something. You know, DJs, different people uh, were able to, you know, have some free drinks. Uh, a DJ was given some money on hand so like if they had their own guests 
that you know they could buy drinks for the, their own guests. Um, ultimately, um, you know, but we could use these with customers as well. So one thing, Bettina, you may want to do when you're thinking about your event is printing up some, not quite a gift card, or, or you know, maybe you do go down to Target to the gift card section and you buy a couple hundred dollars worth of five dollar gift cards, you know, just to have on hand. Um, oh, that makes sense. That's that's a pretty good idea, just to have them like on me. Yeah. So when something happens, just hand it right then and there, right? And you could use them for other things too, for thank yous. And um, at Water Taxi Beach, when we first opened, we had a bar. It was a relatively small bar with four or five bartenders. And we just didn't realize the volume of people that within 20, 30 minutes, we could have six, seven, 800 people enter. And five bartenders just can't get drinks for that many people. So we worked really hard to optimize the bar and have a beer only section and a punch section. and all kinds of things to improve the service, but sometimes it would just be so slow. I had ice cream novelties that I hoped at one point to sell, you know, Ben and Jerry's bars and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Out at the bar, I just go and grab those um, novelties, start handing people waiting in line a Ben and Jerry's bar. That was very nice. Right, and I couldn't get everybody, you know, I mean, but I at least made the effort to say hey we're sorry and uh i know it sucks and um but really essentially following the service recovery path so this is another illustration from the textbook and it's the iceberg the idea that one unhappy customer will lead to 25 i'm sorry that where there's one unhappy customer there may be 25 who don't actually make the complaint in other words you you, you order an apple you get an orange and you decide not to complain because, well, it happens, whatever, you're in a rush, you got to get to the job, you got to get home, you know, whatever it is, you got to get to uh, to church. Um, but when there is one unhappy customer that actually makes a formal complaint, it's likely that there's many more. And then of all those unhappy customers, they're all going to be out there telling their friends and family about their bad experience. And then those will go on to tell more and more. This is essentially the negative side of word of mouth. Um, I think we're all aware of that idea that, you know, if one person tells two people and they tell two people, and before we know thousands of people may uh, have, uh, you know, the understanding that it's not a very good business. Right. But, so now, Using that same diagram, I, I didn't replace the words, but if we take out the un, for every one customer who actually makes the, not a complaint, but an actual sends in a letter, wow, this was really good. There's gonna be many other people who are happy who didn't bother to send in that letter. And all of those people will tell their friends how good the business is, but more importantly, on social media, um, with memes, with, you know, images that they're sharing. And, and in fact, if we can, if we have turned our customers into apostles, that if we are following the service profit chain, that when we get to here, essentially our business could self-market. Now, again, this is hard for an event because if your event's just once a year or twice a year, it's not like that one tweet that somebody makes is somehow going to live and stick around for 355 days and then someone remembers to buy tickets. But still, uh, the word gets out there that this was a good event um, and people ask on Facebook and so forth. Uh, last year I went to uh, Bettina's event. How was it? Did you go? And if a bunch of people say, oh, it was great, you really got to go, um, that's going to you know, go a long way towards getting people there without regard to what the price is or how the parking is and so forth. So, um, can I say something about that? Please, absolutely. So I actually attended a few events, like the one I, that I uh, am going to eventually have. Um, and the first time around, it was okay. It wasn't too bad. 
Um, second, third, fourth time, it was kind of like, okay, these events, it's no good. But I go because I don't want to make the same mistakes. So I kind of go to see what improvements I would make for my own event um, that would improve um, the satisfaction of the customer. So, for example, um, I've been to previous Puerto Rican festivals where, um, for one, if it's a Puerto Rican festival, wouldn't you think they'd have Puerto Rican food? <laughs> so, <laughs> um, they, they, they actually only had one Puerto Rican food stand, three Mexican um, food stands, and then, like, a one Jamaican, and then, like, cotton candy and so forth and i'm like i'm confused right now because you figure they're calling the attention of their target market which is puerto rican people or those of the same culture right dominicans cubans whatever or people but we, who, want, who want to experience that culture right and, but when you go and you don't have that it's it's a disappointment for one not not every day do you get to taste Puerto Rican food, especially if you don't know how to make it or if, you know, grandma used to make it and she doesn't live in town. So you kind of just want to go and taste everything, right? And if you don't have that, it's... What's some good mofongo? Right. And it's just not there. It's like, okay, well, I just spent $35 on what? To sit on the, on the lawn or, you know? Think about this. I think one of the problems is, right, that certain events basically... There are businesses, uh, an ex-employee of mine travels around the country making the hamburger that I taught him to make. And he goes to these massive, large DJ events and other state fairs and stuff. And he's got a team that make these hamburgers. And so the people who are running these events put out a call. Who wants to come and do food? You know, the reality in San Diego is it may not be easy to find people who will come and sell the food, right? Right. Because someone would, might say, oh, you want to buy 500 hamburgers, I'll come and make them. I'll charge you $7 a hamburger. So no, no, I want you to come and sell them. You s just be there. You spend the whole day there. Bring your whole staff. You charge whatever you want for the hamburgers. Or, you know, in my event, we need to have low-cost low food. So you can sell as many as you want, but you can't charge more than $5. So it's, you know, so, well, do I want to invest as a food service person to get up early, bring my grill, get the propane, get whatever licenses I need, um, buy the meat? What if no one comes and now I've got hundreds of pounds of meat, that fresh meat, never frozen, that, you know, is going to get thrown away or whatever it is, I can make chili, but I can't use it for hamburger. So it's a real bit of uh, risk to the business, uh, other food service business to come to your event and vend. Now, if it's a great event, you know, if someone said come to Comic-Con and be a vendor, I'm sure anybody would want to sign up because they know there's thousands and thousands of people there and right. money and they're going to spend. Um, so in, in that case for your event and where you want to offer Puerto Rican food, um, you know, it may be that you need to own that literally in the sense of you hire a bunch of cooks, you know, you salt up the, the green plantains, you get a fryer, uh, you get the, the mortar and pestle out, and you're, you build your own mafungo station. Mm -hmm. uh, or whatever it is, um, you know. Um, oh, God, I want to ask, I want to say, arroz uh, con gangules, or whatever it is that you're going to make, Right, you may not right. find a, a vendor who's willing to come and risk the business. Does, does that make sense? Yes, it does. Right now, if you're successful and you pull this off, and people know, oh, you know, she's got every everyone with some kind of Puerto Rican background. She's got people from the other Caribbean cultures. She gets people who have nothing to do with Puerto Rico but just love coming to the event for the music and the food. And eventually if it's a popular event, then people will want to come and uh, vend. And yeah, you probably still need some Mexican food because there's somebody there who, you know, who wants that just like, you know, right. a Chinese or Japanese event, 
you may still need someone there to make a hamburger. Right. And I completely agree with that. I mean, like you said, you know, it's it's more to try a different culture, but you also have to serve those who are predominantly in in the community, which are in my community in San Diego is mostly Mexican Americans, Filipinos, uh, Caucasian, and then um, you have some from the Caribbean, but not too many. So the predominant um, race is Caucasian and Hispanics of the Mexican culture. So I would definitely, you know, serve them um, by having that taco stand or something to where they feel, you know, that they're also a part of that event. Right. You know, and well, you could make a sort of a mofongo taco, you know, in a sense, like a, you know, kind of make, you know, kind like of- Like a fusion? Like, pardon? Like a like a fusion? Yeah, like you know, you make a you, you pound the mofongo really thin and fold it over, you know, because it's you know we often put filling on top of it anyway, so um, you know put the filling more on the inside. But you know, the other part of that too, you know, is so how to translate it to your to the community that's there. But also, if you think of this as an event you're going to do yearly, um, it may not be that every year you do every possible dish. Um, you know, or carnes frites, fritas, am I saying that right? Carne frita, like fried steak? Fried, yeah, little cubes of fried pork usually, right? Oh, okay, yeah. Um, that, that may not be the dish that you make this year, you know, but maybe some year you do that because you have to invest in, you know, again, if you were to make mofongo, it's just a huge investment in labor, uh, get finding, you know, you're gonna have to buy cases of green plantain, uh, was it maybe 24, 36 hours uh, after peeling them where they're sitting in the salt water and, you know, all of that. Um, and then, you know, the, the sauce that's going into it. Um, so it may be that, you know, you're saying this year, you know, we've got our $5 Mofongo station. Next year, it may be some other food variant and you may or may not do Mofongo. And, 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 so that every year there's something that's a little bit different um, where you're investing in like a high volume, reasonable quality of an, an excellent price, right? Right. Um, and again, it depends, again, if you can get other people to come in and vend. Or if, if you have um, a vendor who's coming in and you can say, look, I'll, I'll let you come in and do, you, you know, your Mexican taco stand food but here's a Puerto Rican dish that's similar to what you already make. Would you make this? So we have at least something on your menu that fits into the overall theme. Right. That makes and, a lot of sense. And these are the negotiations. And so one way that people negotiate food at events is they'll have, you know, like you say, your event starts at 11. So from 11 to uh, 1230, you could do VIP. And the VIP ticket might be a hundred dollars, and every and it's all, the food is all included, and so you have all the vendors that are getting some money for doing that, or they provide that for free, and but they don't have to pay to vend. So then everything after uh, twelve thirty or one, when the VIP is over, that's whatever they sell is what they sell, um, or they agree to do a dish for a certain price, and then everybody gets a ticket. Um, you know, a $5 ticket that they can use. Everybody gets two $5 tickets and they can go to any one of the four or five food vendors and get a $5 item with that ticket. The vendors keep the tickets at the end of the night. Uh, for every ticket they hand you, you hand them, you know, $5. So there's sure. lots of calculus and math and marketing and customer support that can go into this. But um, did I did I lose you or does that that some of those ideas make sense? No, it just it makes a lot of sense. You're just giving me more ideas than what I was really thinking about. You know, just hiring hiring someone, but you know, uh, I, I guess it's more of the negotiation um, that would have to take place to make sure that they would be on board with wanting to make that um, commitment or that fusion. Um, you know, to be able to. Um, get those customers who are willing to try um, something different. But sometimes it's a church group, right, that comes in. So they're not really a, a vendor. They may have to go through some approval 
permitting process to sell food, but you know sometimes it's a church group that comes in that you know so they're making a little bit of money, but they're not trying to make a profit. Meaning it's all volunteer labor, and if they raise a few hundred dollars, it goes back to the church. They're happy. Um, so I have seen these mixes where there's some commercial vendors and then some kind of like volunteer vendors. Okay. But the, overall, I can say it's the first time out, keep it as simple as possible. Don't try to get it too complicated the first time. Okay. So I want to rehash a little bit from the last uh, lecture and, and, you know, kind of wrap things up here. Um, servicescaping comes from Professor Mary Jo Bittner. Um, and again, we've seen, we talked about this slide last week that, you know, the right service gate allowed Wendy's stores to be built cheaper and to do literally more business. The same store, same location with a different service gate could do 15 or 20% more. So you have to think about the design of your event and what can you do to make it easier for the staff and the guests to interact, for the staff to have the things that they need Often some things that are overlooked is having a dedicated bathroom facility for uh, the staff so that they're not waiting in line. Uh, so if someone has to go to the bathroom, you don't lose them for 45 minutes. Right. Um, even if that means that the customers can't use those particular bathrooms, sometimes the large scale events that's needed. And this is the Bittner chart, ambient conditions like temperature, music, Right, and definitely music will be a big part of most events. The space function, so that's the layout, the equipment, the furnishings, then the signs, symbols, and artifacts. Literally the signs, personal artifacts like buttons, you know, logos, colors, then all the material choices like carpeting, drapes, uh, curtains, and so forth. And all of that, we've talked about this last week, create either an approach or avoidance. So approach or avoidance for staff and guests and that space in between where staff and guests interact. And this is the service profit chain. These two are related. They're both focused on how to get customer loyalty, but this is like a chain reaction. You know, we, you think of one marble hitting another marble, hitting another one, or a pool table or one pool ball, you know, you hit the right way and all the balls go into the, um, into the different holes. But so we wanna have internal service quality and we wanna have internal service satisfaction. We wanna be able to retain employees and we wanna have high employee productivity. And all of that, that's the service delivery system or our operating strategy, the strategy being satisfaction and retention and productivity. But that service delivery system then provides external service value. Um, right, so how do we get internal service quality, workplace design, job design, employee selection, employee rewards, tools for serving customers. And then here, external service value, the service concept, you know, we're doing all of this for a particular concept that will give our customers a very specific result. So, you know, we may have a lot of folks at our event, but we know in the first hour or two, where people are getting their badges or credentials or paying to get in, those kind of things. We might have a holdup at the front. So can we have uh, staff that are moving around so that during the first couple hours of the event, they're all up at the front helping people get checked out. Later, some of those staff might move to food service. Um, they might move to uh, other positions like trash disposal, right? If the trash buckets fill up, um, it's gonna turn into a horrible event because all everybody will remember was the trash was overflowing. So that's why you see at events sometimes people using golf carts to remove trash. Um, or, you know, how are the staff gonna eat? How are the staff gonna get water if it's a hot day? Lots of considerations for the staff so that we can deliver excellent customer satisfaction, get that loyalty and get our growth and profitability. Um, things that come to mind, um, you know, when I first opened Water Taxi Beach, I had extra labor, but at the last minute, some of my business partners wanted to do bottles of beer. I was only gonna do keg beer. And the bottles of beer used up so much more labor that I didn't have free labor, meaning available labor to remove 
uh, the trash and stuff like that. So very quickly we got rid of the bottles. Um, but any thoughts there, Bettina? Um, I mean, you, you bring up a great point where you can save a lot um, of money on reusing the same employees once a station is either shut down or um, closed. Uh, after a certain amount of time, that way you don't have to hire so many extra employees to do the same job that they can do. So I'm just listening to all the strategies that you're giving me and kind of processing everything. And, and I would urge everybody listening to think about all these things as you're building out your marketing plan, your business marketing plan. And it's not necessarily like, well, you can't take somebody who doesn't know anything about food service and throw them into food service. Well, you can, obviously you need to have people who know food service, running food service but when it comes time to handing out box lunches or somebody working as a cashier the same person who worked as a cashier in the morning selling tickets can certainly work as a cashier selling the fungo that's true so yeah you know and we again um there may be some need for training and i wanted to just zoom in on this part of the slide here again this is our service delivery system um, that's our staff, their tools, how we hire them, the rewards, right? You can give rewards to the staff. It, maybe it's only your managers at your event. If things go well, I'm going to do this. Maybe there's an after party where you say to everybody, all your staff, the guards, security, um, people from other vendors, say, hey, you know, next week we're having this massive cookout over here in this park for everybody who is here today. Um, and, you know, if everything goes well, you know, we'll give everybody a ticket, that kind of thing, you know, so some kind of reward, a gift bag for staff, again, maybe just people going around, like uh, making sure the staff have plenty, plenty of water to drink and a way to get to the bathroom. All right. Um, so now here is the two charts together. Obviously, they don't line up in some sense, but they're all about this process of customer satisfaction, this up here approach. And this, uh, this half, the bottom half here is about employees. And this top half is about customers. And this is saying all the physical things that lead to satisfaction. And this is just saying all the things and the tools and the opportunity that you have to work with the staff. So again, at the event, may, maybe, you know, you're someplace where there isn't really good computer systems. So th they need lists of things. So printing them out, and maybe you could save some money printing them out tiny on paper, but maybe, you know, you print them out in a way, maybe even with tabs or, you know, in a binder or something in a way that makes it easy for the staff. Um, if there are good computers and stuff, you know, having an app or a program or a database that they can access to look up. You talked about at Target where if someone wanted to get a refund. But if someone shows up and says, you know what, I bought a ticket and I know it says it's not refundable, but this is not the right event for me. Um, I have young kids. I, did, I thought this would be better. Your music's too loud. You know, give that person a refund, even though you said that you weren't, but they still have to look up to see that they actually paid, right? Okay. So just things to think about. So ultimately, this is my big conclusion, Bettina. At okay. your event, we have service, service recovery, service scape, service delivery system, that service profit chain. How can we adapt these tools just for a normal business that runs 24 seven like a hotel for our events, which might run only a few hours. Um, and, and ultimately, things that I said all along today, managers who have walked the walk and know what's what, key staff that you bring back year after year and yourself that you're staying alert. Um, you know, I, I can walk around my beach because it was called Harry's at Water Taxi Beach. Um, and there might be a thousand people there. And I, I, I knew where everyone was supposed to be and what they're doing. I had a, I was paid attention so much. You know, I get like a head count from the security but I could just tell myself how many people were there. And more importantly, I think I could generally tell when things were about to go bad, right? And I could start to do something before 
the problem really happened. Um, so planning, training, again, you could have everybody watch a video. Um, you know, you could make a funny video with all kinds of uh, Puerto Rican terms and, uh, you know, how to, how to <laughs> and, and, you know, so not everybody there is going to know all this stuff, but you could have everybody watch it um, who's going to work there or maybe put it up on the screen in the morning. It's three or four minutes, but, you know, things that you can do in just the few minutes that you have when everybody's there, obviously you can't give them three days of training for a nine hour event. Um, but, you know, for key staff, you might have them there the day before and do an hour or two of training. Then all the same day staff that show up, you know, at 930 for an 11 o'clock event, you could still do 20 minutes, 30 minutes of training, uh, maybe while they're, while you're serving them breakfast, you know, how well do you take care of your staff um, at the beach? Um, we allowed the key staff to, to sleep over um, because th they wanted to get the extra shifts and earn that 20, 30 hours a week of overtime to, in the summer because we're only open a few weeks. So we'd let them sleep there so they didn't have to, if they went home, they'd waste all that time. They, they really wouldn't be able to come back because it, they'd eat up all the time. Um, they wouldn't be able to come back that day. So they'd only get one shift a week instead of two. But then I'd, you know, we'd have, we've had a kitchen there. We'd make breakfast for everybody who was there, the people who overnighted and the people who came in, um, you know, so what can you do? You know, you can hire some other, you know, and you're thinking about like, how do you make it worthwhile for a vendor to come and vend? Well, maybe you, that outside vendor who's, you really want to come and they're not really sure if they want to and how do you make it worth their while? Say, look, we're gonna buy, we got a hundred people working um, we're going to buy breakfast for a hundred from you if you can give us a good price. So that at least gets you there and helps cover some of your costs. And I don't have to spend my time that morning when I'm crazy busy getting breakfast for everybody. Um, and then while people are eating their breakfast, you could do their training, stuff like that. Think outside the box. What do you think, Bettina? That's some serious hospitality for your employees. Like, wow, I want to work for you. <laughs> That's the, and, and that is literally this, right? That, yes. you know, and then they're, they're happy and not angry at you. Now I, I've had my trouble of yelling and screaming when I thought that's what I was supposed to do. But once I realized I wasn't, I, I learned how not to do that. Um, so I'm certainly no myself, no perfect boss, but, you know, learn from my mistakes and, but figure out, you know, you know, if you're showing up to work somewhere and they want you there early and you barely have time, it's the weekend, you were working late the night before or out, whatever, you know, um, come at this time and we'll give you breakfast. Um, it's also a pretty good way of knowing, you know, everybody should show up, <laughs> you know, and then yeah. that, one of the problems at events is people don't show up and then you got to bring in extra people. So you have backup people. Um, so, um, and that is the end of my little lecture. Any, any, any thoughts? Um, um, just, a, a, that's a lot of information. I mean, this is, this is more realistic than I thought in a sense where, I mean, not saying that none of our events are realistic or are not realistic, but in a sense where it's, it's a lot of things I really didn't think about. Um, both detailed and uh, part of the customer service that um, I never really thought would matter for my own event. Uh, but I guess once you start to put everything in place, just like the example for Target, I have to put myself in the shoes of the manager or the person who was taking care of that customer, which would be me, uh, and also think about the employees um, as a manager or the owner of the event and how I would want these employees to be loyal and, um, and actually treat the customers with that respect and that empathy so that they can continue to come back year after year and even, um, you know, spread the word and have other loyal employees um, want to work for the event as well. And perhaps have such a good event that other event people might want to hire you to be one of their key managers, right? Right. And I, I would say this is also some advantage. You know, the Water Taxi Beach, our first year, 
we, we, we were approved to open by the time we got the final Port Authority approval, because it was a partnership with the Port Authority, we only had eight or nine week, weekends that we could be open, but we opened anyway, because we had agreed to. Um, mm -hmm. We were able to get extended a few weeks um, because we got some good press. Um, we got a good write-up in the New York Times. But, um, you know, something to, to think about is how do you start small? So you, what, what's your favorite Puerto Rican music or band? Uh, Mark Anthony. Okay, so you get that, now, whether it's Mark Anthony or it's uh, someone who's, you know, uh, you know, a lookalike kind of band, um, <laughs> right? And, you know, and you set up, again, that Mofungo station and Mark Anthony lookalike band. And that could be the first year, right? It doesn't have, you know, where it could go in year five or 10, doesn't have to be, you know, the first year of the New York City Food Festival, we showed a couple movies and we gave away a few little bits of free food. Today, that was in Queens, Long Island, city, New York. Um, you know, we had 1500 people there because the beach could hold that and it was free food and a little bit of movie. Today, you know, this year, last year we had it, it's in October, we're in Times Square. We only have 300 people, but they're paying $70 a ticket inside oh, wow. of your AMC movie theater. And we do it for five nights. So now, how do you actually, so when you run these events, how do you, are you like partnered with other managers or other? Um... So again, Water Taxi Beach at the beginning, I had a partner, George Motes, the hamburger guy, if anybody knows him. Um, and he ran the projector. He brought a friend to help him with the projector. I did the food. I had my staff there. And that was it. He did the projection. I did the food. It was a food film festival. Um, at this stage, where the festival's been 10 years, for the last seven years, there's been an executive director, a guy named uh, Seth Unger, and he has a whole team. There's three or four, five, six key people who come back. Some of them are volunteers. Some of them are paid. Um, there's chefs, all kinds of stuff. And so I have very little to do with it these days on a day-to-day -day kind of basis. I just show up as the co-founder and, you know, do a little bit of uh, social media and uh, enjoy the food and the movies. Um, the, one of the other ways that we get staff, because we, we need about 100 people to do an event for 300 people. Okay. Is, and, and, and we need to serve alcohol. And so one way to serve alcohol um, is through charitable donations of the alcohol and so forth, but you have to legitimately work with a charity. So we work with, we worked with a food bank and we work today with something called the Billion Oyster Project, which is uh, reseeding the oyster beds of New York City. These won't be edible oysters because the water isn't clean enough, but the, the oysters over the next hundred years will clean the water up. Um, so we get people who will volunteer. So basically we agree to make a donation a large donation to this group mm -hmm. and they can pu and publicize them and they get some of their staff and stuff to show up as volunteers. In other words, oh, they get to nice. come and volunteer because they're getting a big donation. But it's, you know, potentially better for us than hiring people because there's certain, you know, we need to make a program. So we have a printed program inside of that program. Every night we need to put a napkin or two and a menu. So if there's 300 people, we need someone to, you know, make 400 of those. Um, and then that's a trash bag um, and a small bottle of water. And that's got, to, one of those has got to go on every seat. So you can just imagine, the, you know, create the program with the menu and the napkins and then put it into the trash bag and then add the water bottle and put that all on 300, 400 seats in the movie theater and then clean that up afterwards and all many other parts and pieces. So uh, volunteer labor can be very important where you can legitimately get volunteer labor. Hmm, that's a good idea as well. I was doing the volunteer and I think instead of paying, doing the perks, like you said. Uh, yeah, and then, you know, Southwestern College, right? We have these mm -hmm. event courses, you know, can you offer an internship or mm -hmm. kind of thing to people? Um, there's all kinds of ways, you know, at the end of the day, you, you, you get what you pay for in a sense, but, you know, 
someone who's legitimately looking to learn events could be a great opportunity, especially after you've got one or two of these under your belt and it's a legitimate um, experience to come work for you. That is an awesome idea. I was actually going to start my own, um, once I start up my own company, get only Southwestern College students for internships. But now that you mentioned that for the events, that would be something that's realistic, that is hands-on. They can actually get real life experience. Um, uh, you know, depending, of course, their major events, marketing, advertisement, there's something for everybody there. Yeah. Um, it's an internship, so there's a, a double incentive, you know. Exactly. Hmm. Well, I'm, I'm going to bring this lecture to a halt because we, we've hit over the hour mark, but any feedback on the course or these lectures from week to week or any thoughts about how you're coming on your uh, business marketing plan? Um, well, these lectures are definitely helpful, I would say, um, not only because of all the information, but also because um, I'm able to speak to you on um, just the ideas that come to mind. And if I have questions. I, hope, actually, I know it's not the best time for everybody, you know, on a Wednesday night, at this kind of early your time, but it's late my time. But right. Come you know, we can have a whole class and a whole discussion. And I think we'll get more value if people can come. But I, I don't want to make it where you have to come, you know. All right. Uh, well, the plan itself, I feel like it's it's a lot more detailed than the ones I've done in the past. So um, with this type of event, it's a, lot, it's a lot that goes into it. So I'm just trying to get um, as much as I can um, written down and 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 make it as realistic as possible with the research and um, the information I can pick up from around the community. And, and, and look, if someone is really kind of doing a fictitious event and they don't have some of the details, I'm going to be okay with that. But for those of you like yourself who really want to do this, you know, whether it may not be tomorrow, it may be a week or two or a year or two, but are really trying to do this, but, you know, put a lot of effort in because that, that alone is going to help you achieve that goal. And if I can give some good feedback and uh, you'll have something, you know, with the event planning course, um, which I also teach 157, we use software. You can actually plan out your event. Um, so, you know, between actually planning the event and using the tools here, the marketing plan, um, because this is an, this is a marketing class, right? So right. Right service. I guess I really want to hit on that again, because if you don't have good service, you actually can't market the event, because all you're going to be doing is trying to counter the people who say it's a lousy event and don't go. But if you give good customer service, um, then you'll find that your marketing job on some levels is almost done for you, because people are so happy. And like, you know, I had this little problem, they took care of me, and they really went out of their way to make sure that I was taken care of. And, that you know, that those are the kind of stories that make it easy to market an event. Okay. Um, I, I actually have one quick question before we close. Um, I'm doing a business plan instead of a marketing plan. I just think it's more on my side of my, uh, of my major and what I want to do. Um, I mean, I understand the marketing is very important, but for me, I feel like because I do plan on opening the business, like the catering business within the next year or two, I want to make this more of a realistic um, type of plan. So is that okay with you? No, that's, that's perfectly within the scope. If you go back and look at that lecture, I do show what needs to be done. Yeah, right. For the business plan, right? Right. And okay. obviously, you're going to be making Puerto Rican food. Puerto Rican inspired food, Caribbean food. You'll have a range of stuff that you can do. And if somebody wants uh, some French dish, you know, I'm sure you'll make that too. But you know, that your bread and butter is going to be your Puerto Rican cuisine, and there's no better way to highlight that than your event. And, and I, I like my idea of maybe every year focusing like one large high value station on one particular kind of food. Um, so that over a couple of years, people can really see your range um, and that you can do that at scale. And then you may find that somebody has a wedding and they've got all this other stuff, but 
you know, before, after the wedding, but before the party, you know, maybe they want you to come in and, and feed 400 people or after the dancing and before people go home at the end of the night, they want you there doing some kind of Puerto Rican desserts or something. You never know, right? So right. I, I would definitely encourage you uh, to think about how your event will help market your business. Okay. Um, and if you need help, anyone, anyone listening, anyone within the sound of my voice, schedule time with me and let me help you with this. We only have, you know, a few weeks left, but you can schedule time on Zoom as we're doing now and you can bring up your, your plan and we can go through it together. And I'm always happy to give my input and I hopefully um, you'll uh, find it helpful. Okay. Well, thank you. Yes, everything was helpful as always. Well, it's, it's, I really, really appreciate you being here. Uh, it makes it so much easier than just talking to myself. <laughs> I hope you have a fantastic <laughs> week. You as well. Not, right? You never know. Like, you know, if, if there's no questions, it's like that customer service diagram. There's one person who complains. There's 26 who don't. Um, well, you know, if one person, your voice tonight is representing everybody. So thank you so much. No problem. Thank you. My pleasure. Everybody have a great week. This is Professor Shapiro, known on the internet as Harry Hawk, saying bye-bye. <laughs>